Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Shula Connects on engineering biometrics and wearable technologies. Um, I am not Bill Rosehart. Uh, unexpectedly, he was not able to attend, but um, I will try to fill his shoes. Um, my name is Mike Kalos, and I'm a faculty member in the Schulich School of Engineering, and I am the lead of the Biomedical Engineering Research Initiative here on campus. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that the University of Calgary is on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, and the City of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. So I'm going to start this uh, Shula Connects with a few housekeeping items. Um, so we will have an audience Q&A at the end, but feel free to ask questions at any time during the uh, session using the Q&A function. Um, and uh, we'll kind of pop them in if they uh, match what the, the topic we're talking about. And uh, we will be addressing those uh, on the go. I'm going to start with a little bit of a, an update on Schulich. And uh, one of the things that we just had was our engineering design fair uh, 2021. And this was held online this year and was really a huge success and tremendous amount of work by the students. So we had over 150 teams, 160 judges, and over 880 student participants. Um, and teams developed some amazing projects. So some of the top teams developed a non-dairy alternative to milk and a process to make that. Um, improved processes for oil recovery, new 3D printing technology that can also do milling, and improved sustainability of affordable housing, just to name a few. Um, and on the topic of biomedical engineering, which is the topic today, one of the top teams developed an application to monitor risk levels for COVID-19 transmission based on room capacity, social distancing, whether people were wearing masks or not. So very topical and very uh, an amazing application of their, their engineering knowledge. So I'd really like to congratulate um, all the winners um, and all the teams and all of our graduating students. Um, it's amazing. And if you want to check out some of the projects, um, it is all online. And if you go to engineeringdesignfair.ucalgary.com, you can go and check out some of the projects. There's a website for each project with a video, profiles of the students, uh, really, really amazing, and really worth checking out. Um, uh, another update that we're really proud of is our biomedical engineering major. So we are starting our new biomedical engineering bachelor's degree. And I realize now that this slide is way too busy. Um, uh, starting our new major in fall of 2021. And so BME is a, is a key emerging technology in Calgary's economic future and has been identified as such by Calgary Economic Development. It's also a growing industry in the province and Canada and worldwide. And really the demand for biomedical engineers is continuing to grow. And our, our program will meet that need. Um, and we've had um, biomedical engineering, and I'm going to talk a little bit about more about this in a, in a little bit. We've had a minor since 2003 and a Center for Bioengineering Research and Education in Engineering uh, since then. And today we're continuing with this program to be a leader in biomedical engineering research and education. And just a little bit about the slide, the, the program we developed is really a modern biomedical engineering program um, with a, a foundation of real core science and engineering and a strong core coursework throughout the program. But we incorporate design and problem solving throughout using both our network of researchers across campus from multiple faculties uh, in all sorts of different areas as well as our industry, clinical, uh, veterinary medicine and community partners. And so internship program after third year, like all the other engineering programs. And then in fourth year, we're really bringing together all of that core coursework um, and foundational work in, in science and engineering to solve problems and do different design, um, design things. And so the, the students from this program will be able to have careers in the med tech, the biotech, pharma, um, government, uh, med school, a, a number of different areas. So we're really excited about this. Um, next slide, please. So we're this uh, major is part of a, an effort in biomedical engineering that has been going on for 25 years at the University of Calgary. And one of the really unique things about BME Calgary, which is the initiative that I lead here, is that it involves multiple faculties. So you can see on the left there, um, we have the Schulich School of Engineering, Cummings School of Medicine researchers, kinesiology, vet med, science, and nursing coming together to solve problems in human and animal um, health and wellness. And this program, this research program, is really built upon our, our graduate 
Graduate Program, which is a multi-faculty program involving those faculties, which has been at the U of C for 25 years now. Um, and I mentioned our minors, we have undergraduate education efforts as well. And then we have our transdisciplinary engineering solutions for health research strategy. We we'll just flip to the next slide, please. And so this research strategy really brings researchers from across campus together to solve problems in a way that has not been seen at other universities. And so this is a very complicated diagram, but it's really just showing the researchers from multiple different faculties, all working together to solve problems. And I've highlighted our panelists on here, uh, which I'll introduce in a little bit, uh, from kinesiology uh, and uh, two different departments within engineering, and they're connected to a number of other researchers across campus. Uh, next slide, please. And so the, the research area that we're going to talk about today with uh, biometrics and wearable technologies fits into the health monitoring and management sector of biomedical engineering on campus. Um, but there are five other areas. So human mobility is another big research area. Uh, researchers working on concussion, osteoarthritis and sports performance, advanced biomedical imaging. We have real strengths in brain, uh, musculoskeletal and cardiovascular. Regenerative medicine, looking at stem cells and tissue engineering for applications such as burns or diabetes or bone and joint uh, injuries, as well as precision biodiagnostics, looking at cancer detection, infection, infections, sorry, and point of care devices, including COVID-19 detection, and then novel medical technologies, researchers working in a number of different kind of cool technologies, um, like brain machine interfaces and lab on a chip. And each of these has a, has a critical mass of infrastructure and expertise on campus, including strong Schulich School of Engineering participation. Uh, next slide, please. So today, April 22nd, is Giving Day at the University of Calgary. And uh, we are really looking for um, support from the community for student activities um, and a number of other different things. And so if you're interested in that, we'll put the link up at the end as well. But there is a pull down menu for biomedical engineering uh, if you want to donate to that or uh, any other effort on campus. And there's lots of great initiatives on campus and within Schulich that uh, would be great to, to work to give to. So uh, with that a kind of short introduction, I'm going to introduce our panelists and let them do more of the talking now. And so um, our first panelist is uh, Latha Nachiame, and she is a program manager of the biosensor division at Garmin. And she's also an electrical engineering alumna of the University of Calgary. And she manages the research development integration of optical heart rate and SpO2 into Garmin's wearable products. Uh, so thank you very much, Latha, for joining us today. Our second panelist um, is Dr. Reed Ferber. Um, he's a professor in the Faculty of Kinesiology, but has appointments across nursing and the Cummings School of Medicine as well. And he leads the Wearable Technology Research and Collaboration CREATE training program. So this is the WeTrack training program, which is a multi-faculty initiative to um, train the next generation of wearable technology experts. So thank you, Reed, for also being here today. Our third panelist is Svetlana Yanushkevich. She is a professor in the Department of Electrical and Software Engineering and director of the Biometric Technologies Lab at the University of Calgary. She also co-chairs a biometric task force on the IEEE Computational Intelligence Society. So welcome Svetlana. And last but not least is Dr. Steve Liang. He is a professor in the Department of Geomatics Engineering. He's also the Rogers Internet of Things Research Chair at the university, and his lab is the Geosensor Web Laboratory. And he's also a lab scientist of Creative Destruction Labs. So welcome everybody and thank you for being here. So what we'll do is we will have uh, a series of questions. I will randomly pick someone to uh, answer the be the first to answer it. Um, but then you can each uh, have a turn to answer the questions. We will also, again, be accepting questions from the Q&A. So if anybody has a, a burning question that comes to their mind, please type it in there. We'll try to either answer them at the end or fit them in as we, as we go. So um, once again, I really appreciate your time and thank you for joining us today. Um, maybe we'll start by talking about wearables in general. And so there's, there's a trend in the general population to life log or quantified self. So measuring everything about yourself. Um, what do you think is driving this rise in measuring biometrics and the use of wearable technologies? 
And uh, maybe I'll start with uh, Latha to sure, first thanks answer. For, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So I think this technology is it's really evolved from measuring heart rate for elite athletes to help them train. And now it's been, excuse me, it's been widely adopted by the mass market and they really, people want to understand their body. They want to understand their health and wellness. Uh, and we also have a very tech savvy uh, aging population and they really maintain their level of activity and quality of life as they age as well. So it's just, it's easier. It's so easy now to log aspects of your life and measure progress so we can think about how many glasses of water we drink in a day, how many books we read in a year, and we have apps for all that. And I think people, especially scientists and engineers, like we, we like lists and we like to quantify our improvements. And I think this trend just extends to our health and wellness too. Um, you know, a, a few years ago, a quantifiable way of tracking our activity was to see how many steps we got in a day. But we can do so much more in a day. We can with increased use of biometrics, it's possible to track your sleep and your quality of sleep and your intensity needs, uh, you know, your stress levels, your resting heart rate. And uh, I, I think that's, that's where the trend is going. Um, when, you, when you measure something, you can act on it, you can improve. And we see that as a driving force for our customers. So it's just, it's motivating. Um, one of Garmin's campaigns is actually the beat yesterday. And I, I love that. I think that resonates with lots of people. Um, and I think that another key, key uh, aspect as well is that wearable technologies are, have become so much more accessible from a cost and ease of use standpoint. So, uh, you know, and we actually have our new integrated biometrics that are whole wearable, so that's over 40 products today. That's awesome. And yeah, I totally agree with that. I get the sleep, uh, quality of sleep and everything on my, my sorry, Fitbit <laughs> um, every day. Uh, uh, the other panelists, would you like to add to that? Dr. Ferber? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a matter of empowerment. So having run a sports medicine clinic for about 20 some years, you know, when Google first came around, people were coming self-diagnosed. People were consuming information as much as they could, trying to empower themselves because they weren't wanting to rely on someone for all the answers. They wanted to seek it out themselves. And now having that type of information on your wrist or in terms of your phone, I I find it very empowering for people when they, uh, in order to try to prevent injuries, to try to train better, to try to just live a higher quality of life. So I think that it's wearable technology is on the rise so much because it really does provide people with a sense of empowerment in that they're controlling and understanding their, hopefully they're understanding their data and making decisions based on that. Yes, I think there, I think there's a ton of data that we're getting now and it's how, how we each interpret it that uh, maybe needs a little bit of help. Um, Svetlana or Steve? Steve, you're on mute. I'm gonna jump in. Okay, so from a you know empowerment perspective, um, you know, in addition to that, I'm, I'm thinking about I'm a techie, right? Why engineering school event? I think it's also the convergence of several advanced technologies. It just come together at the same time, right? Semiconductor is getting cheaper, it's smaller, the battery is low power, and then there is internet fence, so allow you to connect them in real time. So the user experience got much better. So right now, and also human beings, we are curious, right? We're very curious, right? So suddenly it's echo what uh, Reed said, right? It's like the empowerment. Suddenly we're empowered by all these superpowers. And then it's really time for us to see, okay, uh, what can we do about it, right? So health, but actually there are much more applications uh, than just health, right? Uh, by using the wearable technologies. And then we're just at the very beginning of explore the possibilities, the art of the possible of using these wearables. Now I'm excited. Now I'm very excited. <laughs> Dr. Yanishkovich. All right. So uh, as, as uh, was already mentioned, um, the wearable technology has been uh, in consumer sports and fitness sport, but currently it's moving and ra rapidly expanding to the health and medical uh, uses. Example, uh, monitor and sleep and monitor activity in clinical trials. Uh, this is uh, one of the project my 
uh, group is working uh, on in collaboration with um, stroke unit uh, in uh, Foothills Hospital. So it's it's a it's a need in the in medicine and health sciences that is driving the rise of uh, measuring biometrics. So do you um, you all come from different and and unique um, perspectives uh, with regards to biometrics and wearables? Um, and you mentioned health applications, sport applications, but there's also a number of others, defense, uh, just general positioning. Um, maybe you could each, each talk about um, some game changing or exciting technology you're working on or you're aware of uh, that will basically, as soon as you mention it, people will be so excited to get their hands on it. Well, I think we all want to hear from Latha on this. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to take notes. Here we go. <laughs> Well, I, I think a really a game changing uh, technology for us has been our ability to measure uh, heart rate variability. Um, so what, what this unlocks for us is heart, heart rate variability is the variation um, in the time interval between consecutive heartbeats. So generally, the more variable your heart rate is, the more relaxed you are. Uh, and but then um, the lower your heart rate variability, then the more stress your body is under. So this, this feature actually, it unlocks a lot of wellness features like your sleep, um, your sleep and sleep quality, your recovery after exercise, uh, your stress. Uh, and then we have a feature garment called body battery as well. And this is a number that kind of that lets you know what, what's your reserves, you know, how much do you have in the tank? Do you need to, are you all fully charged? Are you ready to go? Or do you need to take a break and recharge or get better sleep that night? And I, I think that, that features really unlocked a lot of uh, wellness features for people to, for their, their mental and their physical well-being to, to let them know how, how they're doing for the day. That sounds fascinating. I'm wondering if coffee recharges the body battery. That's, it that's it, it actually doesn't. It actually doesn't. <laughs> so it that, puts your body under a little bit more stress. <laughs> it's good to know. That's a good tip. Unfortunately, too late for me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anybody else like to add into that? What's uh, next for you, Svetlana? Well, uh, one of the projects you mentioned earlier uh, in, in your talk about uh, Schulich Hensinger and Capstone Fair, one of this uh, project at risk modeling in, uh, in um, um, university environment based on the room capacity and so on, that was uh, um, the project I, I supervised. <laughs> Oh, awesome. And so the students did amazing job, but our next step would be to uh, have people um, wearing some personal devices or wearable devices and actually do real time monitoring. <laughs> that would be the next step. Um, in general, currently uh, our work in the lab moved towards the uh, kind of very specific biometric called cognitive load and stress detection. Um, we are the plan is to use data from wearables and machine learning, and we currently use publicly available data sets that content, uh, contain uh, electroencephalogram, heart rate, electrothermal activity. Well, the applications are to monitor stress in first responders, firefighters, and astronauts. For example, um, NASA monitors, it is well-known fact, NASA monitors the astronauts on orbit aiming both to learn how information about their bodies uh, adapt, uh, well, how, how their bodies adapt uh, to microgravity, as well as um, they obviously keep track on their health and ability to function uh, on orbit. Uh, and the, this function can be affected by stress. So the, uh, it's very important to monitor stress. Heart rate uh, is one indicator of stress and cognitive load. So um, if you have to think on the time pressure uh, and to reason and to be alert and perform your functions, the cognitive load and stress level increases obviously. And the heart rate uh, can be ind a good indicator along with, the, um, with other uh, measures. So we traditionally measure electroencephalogram, but in wearables, the current trend is to uh, miniaturize the sensors. So one of such sensors, the new one, which we do not develop, but we, we, um, we are happy to use data from uh, and analyze the accuracy of this data is called PPG, photoplethysmography. 
sensor that this is less accurate for now uh, than EEG, electroencephalogram, but um, uh, it's um, uh, developing and it could be um, uh, improved in future. And this is what we're looking for to measure cognitive load and stress through wearable devices. So do you see, um, do you see some gaps in, in things we can't measure right now that we need new sensors? Uh, it's not about the development new sensor. The many sensors were proposed so far. It's about to improve their uh, functionality and accuracy. Mm, okay. And Reed or Steve? I see Steve is unmuted. Okay. So I, I, I have some project working with the uh, Department of Homeland Security in the States and the DRDC Development uh, Defense Research and Development Canada. So it's really for firefighters. So I want to bring you to a dark place. Imagine you are a firefighter, you are in a burning house and then you want to save lives, but you must be wondering, it's like, okay, um, that, you know, what, what, if I get lost or if I'm stuck, can somebody help me? Okay, give you an example. Like the previous, the previous, uh, the, you know, um, firefighter uh, passed away in an incident in Calgary. He died at three feet from the exit. So that means if somebody knew that where he was and then his condition is totally preventable. So, in my, so what we are working on is to use wearables, right? So imagine you are in that dark place, but we put a whole bunch of sensors on you, near you, around you. So suddenly you are empowered, valorit <laughs> empowerment, right? And then you have this unprecedented situational awareness, knowing what's going on. And other people know what's going on about you. And you are fully protected. You are fully connected. You are fully aware. I think that's you know, just a glimpse about what wearable can do, right? In that case, which is really protect you. But also we are moving that, so in a firefighter scenario, right? Into any frontline workers, right? The COVID really, you know, trigger me is like, you know what, we need to protect. And then all, you know, fully protected, fully aware and fully uh, connected. I mean, make, make these for all the frontline workers. So that's, uh, I think that's at least what I'm working on. Yeah, that sounds very empowering. Read. My, my research isn't nearly as exciting as both of those, but the one I will talk about is uh, we've been working on injury prediction, uh, specifically for runners for a number of years now using wearable technology. And we got started on this because I had a patient and I was just asking what her, she was injured at the time and I was asking what her routine was going to be for the next week before I saw her again as a patient. and. Uh, she said, well, I forgot my Nike chip at home, so I can't go run today. And I, I said, well, what's, what's a Nike chip? And this is 2008 uh, when it first came out and she described it to me and I immediately understood that here is technology that can change people's behavior. So it's, it's, it's forcing her to not go for a run because she didn't want to miss out on those miles. So I think wearable technology does a wonderful job of telling you what you're doing and what you've done. And we're working on can it tell you what to do? So can it guide you from a uh, mileage perspective, from a intensity perspective to prevent injuries? Because half of runners get injured every year. Um, and many of those runners, if they have repeated injuries, they go on to develop osteoarthritis, they stop running and become just, uh, uh, they become inactive. So trying to predict injuries and inform runners of this is how you should change your training trajectory even for the week. It's, it sounds simple and it's very complex mathematically. And there's a lot of wearable technology that can inform us. So injury prediction is really what, and we're, we're getting so close to it. We're, we're a matter of years away, like two years. You heard it here first, two years. So that kind of leads to my next question. Reed probably answered it already, is how, how these technologies are changing people's lives. Um, either at work, uh, at play, or in space, as we heard from uh, <laughs> measuring astronauts. So um, can anybody talk, talk about that a little bit more and how, how these things are really changing how people live and make decisions about their life? And I'll pick on someone if there isn't. Uh, there we go, Steve unmuted. Okay, I'll, I'll jump in. So I, I think I, 
I mentioned about the first responders, right? So in a more like extreme or like mission critical um, uh, setting. But I, here's my bold prediction, okay? For any, every deskless workers, and they will become the connected worker of the future. So imagine they have sensors, right? And then really help you to give you this contextual information, right? If you are going to give you early warnings, if it's going to be a dangerous, right? It'll warn you, okay? If you enter a dangerous area for, hot, for too long, it will warn you. If you are closer to a gas leaking, it will warn you. And then, or if you have running in here, it will warn you. So that everybody, these connected workers of the future, can make decisions based on these early warnings. So we are still in control. It's just like there are more information comes in so we can make a judgment to do it or not, right? Because these predictions from these wearables and the AI, right? Prediction, right? And then they are not accurate, right? They won't be 100% accurate, but at least we can, you based on these predictions and use our experience and, and uh, um, knowledge to make the judgment and to make our life safer and more productive. So yeah, let me, I love it, Steve. So, and what Steve's presenting is a, is a, like a red light, green light situation where you can go or, or not go. What we're actually working on is the yellow zone, the, the yellow light, where we're simply trying to provide them the information to make a good decision. So here's one example. So half of runners get injured every year, but well over half of nurses experience low back pain every year. And it costs the healthcare system billions of dollars because they have to take time off work. They have a low back injury. And in fact, 80% of Canadians will have a low back injury. Unfortunately, this has been data for four decades. So informing somebody what their, uh, what their, their total load is for the day. So we can just measure somebody's posture. We can estimate strain on the low back muscles, for example, and, and, and people within the, uh, within, the, within the WeTrack group are working on this right now. It's quite exciting. You can simply tell people, you know what, you're reaching your limit for the day and let them make a decision about do they want to move that next patient on their own or do they want to call somebody in order to come help. So creating that yellow zone where you're simply informing people uh, that's how we're trying to change people's lives. We're not telling them they can't do it anymore. They can just trying to make that yellow zone as wide as possible and give them objective evidence-based information, let them make good decisions. Do you think, uh, do you think employers will be as enthusiastic as employees about that kind of technology? No, but the insurance companies are going to be very enthusiastic and they're the ones who are going to drive it. Sorry, let me jump in again. So Follow that actually for firefighters, right? We did something with Vancouver Fire. And then we have a union rep, right? So basically we put a lot of sensors for firefighters. We thought the union rep would be like furious, right? Don't like this. But actually it's exactly the same thing. There is an expiry date for firefighters, which is the total exposure time to heat, extreme heat and toxical gas. So actually the union is very, very interested in this. They were like, we want this because, you know, it will protect our people, right? So when they know what, you know, when they exceed that threshold and then they can do something about it, right? To lower that down, right? So yeah, just, just add one more example. Interesting. Uh, Latha Svetlana. Don't all speak at once. Uh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've unmuted now. Um, I, I think, you know, when... One example of just how the pandemic has really changed the course of all of our lives. Like we're we're so much more in tune as a society with uh, the importance of our mental and physical health, and so this means getting enough exercise and sleep, but it's also keeping your stress levels in check. You know, getting outside, and I think the the power is that these biometric sensors are they're just silently measuring all of this for you, right? And then then they have they have ways to tell you what's happening where it is, it's motivating and it's encouraging for you to change your behavior and have actionable steps to, to get better and to, um, and to take this holistic approach to your health and wellness. Um, we, we have some really interesting data on how our farming users, um, how they uh, reacted in the pandemic and you know, they, they logged more activities. They tried new things and they couldn't uh, they couldn't run with their running club. So it was more yoga activities. It was more at-home workouts. 
um, you know, there is more people doing breath work exercises, right, to decrease their stress. And, and we, we saw that. So I think this is a, it, it's really that holistic approach to your health and wellness that I think these uh, technologies um, unlock for people and, uh, and it gives you actionable uh, information right, to make improvements. I've done the same kind of thing, except yeah. I've probably done less steps as a result of being at home, not more. So it's the reverse, but at least it's my Fitbit's telling me you shouldn't be sitting so much. Uh, Svetlana. Okay, so to summarize, um, wearable technology is allowed to move from the um, health monitoring in the um, clinical setup, right, using bulky devices. Uh, to, to really personalized uh, personal devices. For example, um, you can, um, these days you can monitor not just the fitness, but also the heart rate. So by monitoring heart rate variability over weeks and months, which is very hard to do in clinical setup if you are not in, in hospital, for example. So uh, by monitoring it using um, wearable devices, personal devices, user, users can immediately be alerted uh, to a change from the baseline, which, which suggests the, the, the body uh, is not functioning well and, and um, this could be um, caught up instead of uh, waiting for the, for, for, for the clinical emergency to happen. Yeah, very interesting. So I've got a couple questions in the chat about um, accuracy of wearables. Um, and so there's accuracy with respect to consumer use of wearables, but then there's accuracy when you talk about clinical applications. Um, and uh, the, the question also mentions um, if you're collecting from multiple sensors and they're not as accurate, it might be some compounding effect. So I'm wondering, uh, I'd be very interested in hearing about this from our panel as well. Yeah, Svetlana, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, I can start briefly. Um, so that what we call compounding effect is, is in reality is used already, of course, in uh, in, in research and in um, a specific and uh, obviously in, in um, implementations and it used uh, for a long time in, in military. Uh, so I'm talking about uh, fusion in signal processing. So fusion can happen at the data level, fusion can happen at the decisions uh, level, the uh, classify output level when we want to classify signal or to detect signal or to to analyze signal so it's um it's a work in progress for such for sometimes for small devices <laughs> but again the fusion is not necessary to be happen or at the device level when the data is transmitted wirelessly uh, it can be processed uh, on um and um uh, it can be processed on uh, not on the edge, but in the, the, the data processing centers and much more uh, better accuracy uh, can be derived uh, from the cumulative data through this fusion. And I wonder, Latha, if your your company looks at uh, accuracy of the, the information and how, how you're working towards making it more accurate if it's not and uh, assuring that. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're always, um, you know, our, we're so we're very focused on research and innovation, um, and and having uh, and, and testing our, our sensors thoroughly, and always still you know, um, raising the bar of performance and accuracy for these devices. Uh, uh, you know, when I started at Garmin five years ago, we were getting heart rate to work, and you know, now now we're at this point where we have we have so many iterations of the sensor that we've improved uh, accuracy and uh, we, we know so much it's a whole field on this, uh, but what we can do to improve accuracy so it's definitely something that, that this is a quite a, a new field so it's something that we're always learning and uh, and it's it's important for I think all for researchers and for the industry to make sure that they have a lot of um that they uh, invest a lot in R and D and innovation just to make sure that they can continue improving accuracy, and that go it, it goes from the whole the hardware to the mechanics to the software and the algorithms. Um, uh, it's a it's a very cross discipline endeavor. Okay. It sounds very challenging, and I saw Steve and Reed, and I don't know who unmuted first. I'll let Reed first. <laughs> there we go. So about two years ago, there was a nice review article published. Um, 
and it was published because the field of wearable technology is so fast moving that companies are sprouting up all over the place and going bankrupt almost nearly as quickly. But what's interesting about this review is that they stated that less than 5%, less than 5% of wearable technology that's commercially available has been validated. Now, the good news is that companies like Garmin, Fitbit, Apple, Polar, for example, uh, they are valid devices and they have been, they, they dominate the market. So really what people are buying are, are valid devices. So in fact, we published validation studies on the Garmin Running Dynamics pod um, a few years ago. We actually installed kind of a mini gate lab for Garmin Cochrane um, so that they can use that type of scientific equipment in order to validate their devices as well. But it really is buyer beware a lot of times because these new companies sprout up, they make large marketing claims, and sometimes they're not quite as valid as we would like. So I would personally like to see more partnerships between these where, and that's the whole point of WeTrack is to reach out and we have nearly 40 companies that we're working with as part of the WeTrack program in order to help give our students unprecedented access to these companies and give these companies really good access to university resources. Okay. Fantastic, Steve. I want to be controversial, okay? <laughs> so that is, a, that is a purpose of panel, right? Accuracy, do we, how accurate do we want to be, right? I, I totally agree, we need to validate those, right? But I want to encourage people to think about it. Actually, to what degree of accuracy, you know? So it's, it's getting more and more accurate, right? But I want to think about, you think about, actually it's, it's linking back to Reed said, the, the yellow zone, because it doesn't have to be super accurate. And to a certain degree, it will enough for you to make your decision. And I encourage everybody to think about it. Okay. And to what degree when the prediction is accurate enough, and then it will create a dynamic shift. That means it will change things you behave, the change the way you work and play. It doesn't have to 100% accurate, accurate. But so I, I think in, in the chat, right, there was a question about, you know, why they are not validated, right? Because a lot of startup companies you were know, like, that, that's fake it before you make it, make it, right? So they, they, they just want to get there first. It, it's a game about speed, right? And unfortunately it's a, you know, yeah, marketing, blah, blah, blah. But so I, I think that that's one of the reason actually that's why the companies and universities should work very closely together, right? Because we can become a gatekeeper to make sure a, you know, credible source about the accuracy, the effectiveness, right? And let us stop coming to run. Okay. So, so no, <laughs> so when you talk about, um not having to be that accurate, that seems more consumer facing, but what about in a, in a clinical setting? Uh, is accuracy more important there or the same, same kind of things would apply? I think there's a spectrum, right? Which market or application will adopt it first? And then you see stop company, right? They, 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 they pivot in different places, right? I have a friend, he has a company called Hexoskin and then it's a wearable shirt and he used to sell them in Best Buy. But right now he's going to the other direction. So he sailed to CSA, that's Canadian Space Agency. So astronauts are wearing them, right? Because he think, he think, okay, I'm gonna focus on the high accuracy market. That's where I shine. He won't sell them like everybody have a hexo skin, right? In from Best Buy, right? And then, so it's really about where do they focus, right? And they have different cost, right? A different um, uh, accuracy requirements, right? So I, I see it's a great, you know, it's yeah, let the market decide. <laughs> I'm controversial again. Oh, wow. Perfect. Anyone else want to add to that uh, kind of accuracy? I think Svetlana is typing something in the chat. And so is Reed. Wow, we're answering more questions than, than humanly possible. Perfect. Enabled all by wearables. Um, I'm going to move to the next question that I wanted to, I'm really curious about, which is um, we've got all these new technologies. Um, it's very hard to keep up from a regulatory point of view. Um, and so policy, um, privacy, and ethics. Um, and I'm going to leave it kind of open at that. Uh, could, could one of you start, start a talk maybe about that? I see lots of nodding. Who wants to go first? Svetlana. Yes, uh, this subject is, of course, is extremely important in, in, in biometrics and in, in all wearable technologies. So uh, it's, it's, it's well known that the ethical concerns include multiple uh, things such as 
um, validity in interpretation of data and how you treat the data and, and data storage. So the other concerns are increased threats to privacy uh, when you um, that when the data um, <clears throat> uh, can be <laughs> accessed uh, um, wirelessly. The risks to conf confidentiality and concerns regarding data security at all levels, not just storage, but transmission and the processing part. And of course, it can cause the conflict of interest and, and can, can lead to, to many different uh, uses and abuses of the data. So, um, at the, uh, when um, researchers at universities developed this technology, um, well, before the clinical trial, just in the lab, uh, we um, try to address this by, um, by the principle, we call it privacy by design, uh, to, to, to predict the possible, um, uh, the possible uh, remediations to, to, to those. But um, when it's uh, come to clinical trials or development of real device, obviously uh, what is guarding there is the industry standards. There are industry standards for uh, security privacy of data transmission, data storage, and, and, and other. So for industry standards, I think uh, um, uh, Latha here can talk more, but uh, again, for, for us as uh, university researchers, we are well aware of that. Um, and we try to address it from the early development uh, stages of the, of the technology. Latha, do you wanna jump in? Sure, yeah, yeah, I think that it's, it's true. It really has to be by design. Um, so Garmin's a global organization. And, you know, it's, it's really important for us to be committed to following all the regulatory requirements. And I, I think it's important for, um, for, the, for us as users to also push our, our uh, to understand the regulations and, and push our elected officials as well if we feel like there, there needs to be changes there. Um, I think a good example is GDPR and that's the uh, European Regulations for Privacy Standards. Um, and it's, uh, I think as, as users, we have to understand that how, how our data is being used and uh, what the, what our access uh, rights are to that data. So, you know, I think it's, it's important to read that fine print and ensure that you are, you're, you're using uh, a service, like you're using, you're using a service that uh, treats your data and the privacy that you require. And I think, so build on these policy and regulations, right? But also there is a research component there. So yesterday I just did a webinar about preserving data privacy for you know, location data, right? So it's, it's about how can we do research and then to prevent that when we share the data with others, we can keep the data, right? Uh, anonymize the data. So make sure the personal identity cannot be, be uh, attacked, okay? And then there's computational method to do that. So I'm in geomatics, right? So it's, we are about location. So location data is, you know what? You can remove the names, all the personal identifiers, but how many people live in varsity every uh, 7.30 and drive to a school and then and come back and go to university and come back? One. <laughs> so people know that's steep, right? So how their computational method, how to uh, make sure when you share this data, and then how you know to hide those identities, right? So actually, there's a role for researchers to play in the in, in there. Um, yeah, you can take my course to learn those computational methods. Anyways, <laughs> as a small plug, <laughs> uh, Dr. Ferber, anything to add on on this yeah, topic? I think, uh, I think from a healthcare perspective, we're seeing a lot more uh, physicians get on board with wanting to use the data as a dynamic vital sign, if you will. So as opposed to having a patient. Uh, get blood work, urinalysis, uh, have your blood pressure taken, et cetera, in the office. Physicians are wanting to look at activity patterns over weeks and months in order to try to make better decisions about how are their patients responding to treatment? How are they post-surgery, et cetera? So with physicians getting on board, I think it's becoming more clear that wearable technology will play more of a role in the healthcare system and that from a regulatory standpoint, uh, we'll be able to push it beyond what it is right now. And then I'm gonna put a plug in. So I just put it into the chat window. 
Uh, so we have started the wearable technology citizen science program. If you go to wetrack.ucalgary.ca, anybody right now, anybody with a Garmin, Fitbit, uh, Polar or Sunto device can share their data with us and, and you own your data. So by sharing it with us, we're able to do um, scientific research in order to, uh, and we're, we actually built the citizen science portal to support the 30 some projects that are going on on campus right now, because researchers are overwhelmed with the amount of data that comes from a wearable device. As soon as you put it on a research participant and they're wearing it 24 hours a day, maybe for weeks, the volume of data is overwhelming. Physicians, we're, we're partnering with many researchers, clinician scientists in the coming school of medicine, because they're wanting to monitor their hemodialysis patients, their cancer survivors as examples. And the portal allows us to manage the data securely. It's in a level four secure server on campus, but anybody can become a citizen scientist. And when you do that, you're sharing your data with us. And as I said, Fitbit, Garmin, Polar, these are, these are valid scientific devices that people are using on a daily basis. That allows us the opportunity to do very unique research. One such example is just looking at fatigue patterns in both runners and clinical patients and really understanding what the day to day hour by hour fatigue patterns look like that will help us transform this field of wearable technology in healthcare. Very nice plug. Um, I had a follow up on the regulatory. And so my research is in stem cells and it seems like the, the laws and regulations are always behind the research and you care about kind of stem cell tourism in Mexico and things like that. So uh, in, in your field, are the regulations and industry standards keeping up with the, the fast pace of technology? Maybe Latha could start uh, with an industry perspective. Uh, you know, I think people are a lot more aware of their personal data and and why they want to protect it and who owns it. So I. I think that push from the public to to their elected officials and to change regulations. I think that's going in the right direction. And you know, we we know the power that like, that these big big tech companies can have on our data, like Google and Facebook. And I, I think that the the tone has really shifted in the last few years, where um, where the the regulations are starting to keep up with what uh, what the public is requesting. Anyone else uh, want to add to that? Do you agree? I just see some nodding. Perfect. <laughs> that's good. So uh, another thing that's uh, that was uh, important for this, or I think it is, but I want to get your opinion, is uh, interdisciplinary research in in developing these wearable biometric type technologies. How how important is that? I, I'm going to start. So. As per usual, I am the dumbest person on the panel, which I love because it's critical that, so I always say I am, I am not gifted enough to be a clinician. I am not nearly smart enough to be an engineer. I know enough data science to make me dangerous. But what I am is the one person who can sit between those three worlds because clinicians want to answer important questions. Researchers, or sorry, engineers feel like they can build anything but sometimes what they build is not useful to a clinician. And the data scientists have fantastic capabilities to analyze data, but sometimes it's not clinically relevant. So you need, in, in my opinion, need to be able to have those three worlds, that transdisciplinary panel and research. And then you need a dumb guy like me who just knows enough about each of those to kind of pull it all together because one cannot function well and really can't make an impact without the others. And I'm just talking about those three worlds uh, that are my worlds. I think it's not the first time, right? Reading I, we are on several panels already, uh, you know, so I love to do this like, you know, the dumb and dumbers, right? So I'm dumber than read. <laughs> okay. And then <laughs> I think the fact today's panel, the, you know, the roster of today's panel, it says it's interdisciplinary by nature, right? We have a guy from geo, we have a read, and we have a electrical, we have a industry. It's, it will, you know, biomed, right? We have a chemical engineering, right? 
by nature, it's in, in interdisciplinary. So it, it will be. <laughs> Svetlana or Latha, yeah. Yeah, I can, I can go. So I, you know, I think to be successful in this, uh, in this space, interdisciplinary research and collaboration is key. Like we, we need a team of hardware engineers and hardware engineers to design the electronics um, and the embedded software, but then we also need mechanical engineers and they have to design a solution that's robust and it's comfortable, right, for, for people to wear. Uh, we need software engineers to just design the basic signal tracking algorithms. Um, but then, and that's just for the sensor. So then on top of that, then we need to be able to unlock the value of the sensor. And, and to do that, you really you need talented product managers that have a vision for how people can use this data and this technology. Uh, you need other software engineers on top of that to, to write these uh, complicated algorithms that, that use that data and, and give people metrics that they can act on you know, give them their training mode and their performance status. And uh, like Reed was saying, you know, in indications that you're, you're going, you, know, you may have an injury if you continue with this pace or um, you know, adaptive training plans, things like that. So it's uh, to, to really un unlock the, first you need to have a really great sensor. So you need engineers to be able to design that. And then on top of that, you need, you need uh, and engineers and product managers to, to unlock the sensor can give you. Svetlana? Yeah. So um, by nature, the biometric, for example, is of course uh, truly interdisciplinary. I give you an example. I teach the course on biometric systems design. So I start with statistics, uh, 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 areas that are important in biometrics, then go over signal process and techniques that we use in biometrics, machine learning and classification, and even data management and, uh, and the choice of the uh, software and hardware uh, for the successful implementation of the system and performance valuation uh, of the software and hardware that we use. So it's, it's truly interdisciplinary. And I'm going to put a plug in for biomedical engineering here, which is truly interdisciplinary. That's it. Just a short one. Um, so I wanted to ask, I think we're kind of approaching near the end. We got about five, 10 minutes left, um, uh, kind of looking ahead. So in five years, what will wearable and biometric technologies look like and, and what challenges need to be overcome to get there? And maybe I'll ask Latha as our external guest to uh, start sure. that one off. Sure. So I think just like most high tech industries, the trajectory there of the wearables, it's going to drive towards more accuracy, uh, lower costs, lower power, smaller sensors. Um, and I think wearables will be more ubiquitous than, than now. Um, and then I think that the expectation from customers will really increase as well. Like they, they will want high sensor performance and accuracy, uh, and they'll want it through the whole wearable line, right? Like from from the cost effective, you know, cheaper, cheaper wearable devices to the really high end luxury watches that also integrate, integrate um, biometrics. Um, I also think that there'll be increased partnerships with universities and research institutes. Uh, I, I see that as a driver as well in the future. Um, and then, you know, we've, we've seen technology evolve from this, this evolve for from fitness for athletes to like wellness metrics for everyone. And I think we'll see that continued growth as well, um, just with some more convergence with the medical field uh, and, you know, maybe even with mental health and wellness as well. Uh, and, you know, for us really our, our biggest challenge is hiring enough talent to fuel this growth. Like we, we have more ideas than, than people to execute on them. Uh, and that, that's definitely one of our biggest challenges that, so you know, we're, we're growing company and department talking. We're, we're always looking to get more talent. We're trying to grow more for you. <laughs> Thank Just, you. We're planting the seeds. We're planting seeds this year. They'll be yeah. ready soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Steve, I think you'd unmuted. So I'm going to. I'm a geomatic engineer. So this is from a geomatics perspective, right? So my bold prediction is in the next two to five years, Everything that you can track will be tracked. You will know the location, not including humans, uh, as well as your pet. <laughs> okay. And then, so I don't know how you know, like 
Apple just announced AirTag, right? It's really coming, the IoT devices tracking. Uh, but actually the key is really about, from my perspective is how much insight do we get these dots on the map? Not much. So in the next two to five years, we'll really try to get more insights from these abundant ocean of wearable data for location. And I think that's really, they'll be exciting in the next uh, couple of years. Awesome. And Svetlana. Yeah, I will be brief. <laughs> My prediction that uh, first of all, it's smart clothes, smart fabrics, and uh, very interesting uh, direction that I would like to bring up. It's uh, chemical sensing in human sweat. Very important for, for um, for athletes and and for clinical applications. So we started that right at the end. We could have a whole other hour. Anyway, I'll give Reed the final word from the panel. Well, if I get the final word, then I'll say I'm definitely dumber than Steve. I'll leave it at oh, that. Geez. But <laughs> no, uh, Svetlana hit it. Uh, uh, the printed electronics. So right now we have fantastic researchers at the University of Calgary who are printing electronics as fabric itself and think our socks, our underwear, uh, that is how we're going to monitor our step count, heart rate, blood pressure. We won't be wearing it on our wrist anymore. Uh, it'll be part of our fabric of our clothing. I think that's coming very, very soon. We're going to be buying our wearable tech in quotes at Walmart at sport check. And we're not going to be buying a watch for example, or a sensor to attach to our shoe. It will be our shoe. It will be our sock. And that's how we will be monitored in terms of all these metrics. That sounds amazing. And that sounds like what you, what you usually say, Reed, is that you wanted to tag everyone like wildlife and measure where they go. <laughs> that's probably what, what, we'll, what we'll be like. And we could ask a lot of questions about that. I saw something in the chat, but I think Svetlana is maybe answering it. Um, so I think we've got maybe one or two minutes left, but um, I would really like to thank um, the audience for joining us and some really great questions. Hopefully uh, most of them got answered. Um, I also really would like to thank our panelists, um, uh, Latha for coming from industry to give us that perspective and alumni. So that's really fantastic to, to have you back. Um, so thanks very much, uh, as well as Reed and Steve and Svetlana. I think Steve had to go to another panel, so he's not on the screen anymore. Um, but really thank you for your insights. Uh, thank you for a good sense of humor throughout this. I think uh, I had a lot of fun. I uh, hope the audience did as well. Um, I just want to promote the next uh, Shulet Connects, which is on May 27th. And I think there's going to be a slide pop up. Perfect. This is on equity, diversity, inclusion in engineering. So um, again, same time, 8.30 to 9.30. Uh, Bill will be hosting that one. And I think you can sign up uh, online and register for that right away. So I think with that, um, I will close the session. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Go get your steps in. And uh, thanks again to the whole panel.